Welcome, people. Welcome. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, it's a little crazy here right now. I am desperately trying to share on Facebook Live, but it is not working for me. So um, the Facebook Live people will just have to be disappointed, I think, tonight because it's not working. For some reason, I can't see it. But we have such a great group that are coming in by the dozens over Zoom. And so um, I just, I'm so glad to be here with you tonight. Now, we always type down into, um, oh, good, Bill and Ellen, you're here with me. Love it, love it. Um, I, I always type into chat the welcome, all right? And if you go down to the speech bubble and click on that at the bottom of the, your screen, sometimes it's on the side, depending on your device. And then you can type either to everyone or to me, uh, whatever question you have later, that's number one. I love to hear who you are and where you're from. Jill, welcome. I'm glad that you are with me today. It is cold here. I know Bill and Ellen, you are still in um, warm Florida. It's typical March on Cape Cod <laughs> today. And um, it is not only uh, sunny and very nice, but it's also quite cold. So uh, yes, so tell me where you are joining me from. If you uh, feel inclined, you can tell me what's in your glass. Sometimes people say what they are bringing to the happy hour. And as I always remind people, it doesn't matter what's in your glass. It could be a cup of peppermint tea. Uh, it could be sparkling water. It could be a cocktail. The whole point of a happy hour is that we are here together and we are sitting down, taking a deep breath, relaxing, and we're going to talk about plants. So I'm just so glad you're all um, chiming in here about where you're joining me from and uh, what is in your glass. So keep it up. The numbers keep rising. We had 308 people registered for this um, tonight. And that means we'll probably get about 250 uh, on the call. So um, uh, thank you, Anne. Anne says, did I get my hair done? Oh boy, my hair is overdue for being done. Uh, COVID has done my hair right now. <laughs> so uh, I, it is overdue, but I did make the effort to comb it. So there we go. Um, and I've uh, got my new background here, my new brick wall, and I've got my usual LOL loam. I was in Country Garden today and I was just enjoying the primroses and the, um, they've got on the patio daffodils and you know those things that we just love to see because they lift our hearts and so i was just so happy to see that so welcome everybody audrey and Lori and jennifer and thelma uh, and nancy and i, I just that you're coming in so fast that I can't even welcome you all by name, but know that I am really, really pleased that you are joining me tonight. We're going to talk about perennials tonight, and I just want to wait another minute or so in order to get people all online. Let me share with you here. Do I have a book to share? Oh, I do. Um, and I don't think I've shown this to you, but this is um a new book by my friend Jessica Walliser, and it is called Plant Partners. If you have a vegetable garden, you should get this book <laughs> because it is about companion planting in a vegetable garden, but it's not all that ridiculous stuff of carrots hate tomatoes and, you know, talk as if these are high school cliques. Um, this is a book that is science-based. And so she gives the references behind the companion planting or intercropping methods that she talks about. And it's all about making your garden healthier, right? With fewer pesticides and fewer poisons. And it talks a lot about flowers combining with vegetables. So 
um, Plant Partners by Jessica Walliser, a really um, good new book fresh off the press. So I am so glad you are all here with me today. And um, we are almost ready to get started. Let me explain to anyone who is joining in for the first time. Um, how I work these is, um, you know, right now you're, you're chiming in with where you're from and, and what's in your glass through the chat. And later I will take questions in chat. So as questions come up, and I'm, I'm taking questions about perennials, not necessarily annuals, not vegetables. We've got other programs on those coming up, but it's a perennial day today. And so I'll be taking questions after I finish showing you some great photographs, all right? So um, let me also tell you that for those of you that are in the area, um, I have done a handout of all the plant names that I am going to show you tonight. The plant names are on, I believe, all of the slides, unless I missed something, which I might have. Um, but I think that they're on all of the slides. And if you want to remember, and you're not in the area, take a photo with your cell phone or take a screenshot or something. And um, so anyway, it... Uh, um, it's it's going to be a handout with all those names and when they bloom, spring, summer, fall, etc., and whether they grow in sun or shade. And that's going to be available at the registers when um, we probably get it printed out, which will, might be Monday or Tuesday. So if you're in the Hyannis area, stop by and tell um, one of our excellent team members at the register that you would like a copy of the perennial handout from tonight's happy hour and they will get it to you. So, oh good, uh, Diane, you're enjoying a, a Cape Cotter. Um, I have tonight a um, cranberry juice cocktail made with unsweetened cranberry juice. So it's a little tart. And uh, it's got a squeeze of fresh orange in it along with the cranberry juice and some vodka. So cheers to you. Mm. Michelle, the name of the store in Hyannis is Hyannis Country Garden. And let me just go on to um, my screen here and share that with you, all right. And there we have the logo and everything, Hyannis Country Garden. Uh, I've been an employee at Country Garden for mm, about 25 years now. And uh, when I first started work there, I started in the perennial section. And so um, perennials are of course near and dear to my heart. And I st thought about calling this matchmaking because I was thinking, what if perennials had a matchmaking site, you know, like match.com, you might see, you know, a personal ad placed by a perennial, single blue cat mint looking for a partner for fun in the sun, right? Um, or maybe you'd see healthy hosta seeks mate must love shade. Well, it's not only that we want to combine perennial so that they are happy, which we do, of course, we also want to choose the perennials so that we are happy, so that we have a good match with the plants. And that's really an important thing. All right, so let me just, I'm trying to get my um, image to be a little larger here. Uh, I don't know whether you can see that my image is a little larger, but I hope so. Okay, so um, here's a kind of a list of things that people look for when they are matching a perennial with themselves. And I think that number one, so many people are looking for low maintenance, right? Um, number two, they are looking for plants that thrive in the shade or in the sun, but a lot of people are looking for plants that thrive in the shade. And I heard from several of you um, by email in advance. So not to worry, I have plants for you. Um, they're also looking for perennials with long lasting flowers. As we all know, anyone who has grown perennials, you know that the perennials that say blooms all summer, 
those tags are as accurate as the ones in clothing that say one size fits all. <laughs> so we have to take that with a grain of salt. Basically, there are no perennials in this region anyway that bloom spring, summer, and into fall. Annuals do that. So, but perennials, however, because they bloom at different times, that's the advantage to them. We have that kaleidoscope out in our yards and gardens. And it, it just, you know, it's wonderful to discover what's coming into bloom. So um, we want to make some good perennial matches tonight. And I do want to say that, you know, of course we want the right plant in the right place. And we want a garden that has plants that bloom at different times. Now, this is important because you do want that kaleidoscope, you know? And sometimes what happens is people come into the garden center in May because they're all excited, right? And we have all the new perennials in and they buy the plants that have flowers on them then. And then they discover in August and September, they have no flowers. So we want to pick plants that bloom at different times. We also want to pick plants that have different kinds of foliage. And I'm going to be pointing out foliage to you as we go along tonight. And you want to also be careful because a lot of people think that if they, you know, uh, plant perennials, it's going to be less work than annuals. But um, anyone who has had a perennial garden knows that it is the most high maintenance garden you can plant. And so I say, be careful, be careful with the size of the perennial garden you create. Now, I love perennials. I have a lot of perennials, but I also know that they are a lot of work. And so this might be gorgeous. You might say, I want that. But know that in a, this garden, in between all those perennials is bare earth. And what does nature plant in even a square inch of bare earth? Weeds, right? So a garden like this takes weeding probably spring, summer, and fall. And um, a good nine months of the year, nature is germinating seeds in this garden, every place in between perennials and even in the perennials. And that's why it's a lot of work. Now, I do wanna put in a, uh, a green thumbs down for pass along perennials because many of them come with a problem. And I always remember my friend Stephanie Foster uh, years ago saying to me, I have one rule, she says, I never accept a plant someone wants to give me. And she said that because if somebody wants to give you a plant, there's a reason they have it to give away. It might be a plant that spreads very quickly, like this gooseneck loosestrife. It might be a plant that needs frequent dividing. Um, or it might be a plant that self-seeds itself all over the garden and, and they have to get rid of it. So be careful with pass along plants. The other thing is pass along plants also often come with pass along problems. Unbeknownst to you, that plant might contain some of the worst weeds in the book like this one, Bishop's Weed. I accepted when I lived in the mid Hudson Valley, I accepted daylilies from a friend and what popped up all around those daylilies, but this Bishop's Weed, I battled this bishop's weed for 11 years before we finally moved. And I have to tell you, I didn't bring any plants from that garden with me, even though I loved some of them because I really did not want to move this highly problematic weed to my new landscape. These are the flowers on bishop's weed. Bishop's weed, by the way, is one of the plants that's illegal to sell in the state of Massachusetts now. That's that's how invasive it is. That said, cautions aside, let's look at some great plants. And we're going to start off with some great plants for sun. Now, there are hundreds of perennials and many of them are great plants. Um, I am featuring the ones that I know to be fairly 
um, hardy, that I know to be pretty long lived, and that I know to be pretty low maintenance, not ex no maintenance, okay? And I say pretty, I kind of qualify that um, because there is no completely um, problem-free, carefree, low maintenance perennial. That's just the way it is. So let's start off with spring. In spring, you have to have daffodils, of course. Now I know they're a bulb, but they play an important role in your perennial garden because in April and May, when everything else is this tall, right? Those daffodils are going to be flowering and they're gonna make you feel happy. So you have to have daffodils in a sun, um, sunshiny perennial garden. And by the way, pretty soon right now, some of these plants are poking up. The daylilies, for example, are starting to poke up. And if you have bunnies, get out there this weekend and spray them with a rabbit repellent. Come on into the store. They'll get you fixed up with a rabbit repellent. You can um, spray that new foliage. It's important because at this time of year, there isn't that much for the critters to eat. And so, you know, Bambi and Thumper, they're gonna be coming out looking for anything green. And what you want to do is get that repellent on them uh, so that they don't think that that's on their menu. All right, creeping flocks, I think is a must grow perennial plant. Now I will tell you this about creeping flocks. And that is you do not want to plant it where you have an automatic irrigation system that's going to be hitting it all summer. That is the kiss of death for this plant. You certainly should water it if we're in a drought, but once a week or even every two weeks is all that this plant needs. Right now, if you have this plant in your perennial garden, it probably looks a little sad. Every year in March, I kind of look at my uh, creeping phlox and think, hmm, is it dead? It's not dead. It's just winter weary, and aren't we all? Um, so just wait, it'll do this. It'll come back into full glorious bloom. And the other great thing about this plant is that it's pretty weed smothering, all right? So you don't have to weed in the phlox. And it also looks nice and green later in the summer when the other perennials, like you know your daylilies or whatever you've got behind it, when they're coming up and blooming, this plant still is attractive. And you know, that's what we want. Amsonia should be more widely planted. This one is the Amsonia hubrechtii, and it has, look at that fine, fine foliage. Um, this is a plant that it blooms in the spring with these pale blue flowers, very pretty. But I have to tell you, when my garden is open in July, this is a plant that people ask, what is that? And they ask because they love the foliage. So again, you plant that very fine, bright green foliage next to either something with purple leaves, like here I have behind it, one of the physocarpus shrubs, or you can plant it um, next to something with big leaves, like a hardy hibiscus that blooms later in the summer. And then you have two for one. You've got early blooming and late blooming. You've got fine textured foliage and large leaf foliage, and your garden is going to be gorgeous. Some perennials for sun for early summer flowering. Geranium sanguineum. Now I'm on the perennial geraniums, I am always going to give you the botanic name. So if you can't remember it, take a picture with your phone, uh, shoot a screenshot right now uh, so that you have it because a lot of these perennial geraniums, they all have the same common name. They're all called bloody cranes bill. Well, what good is that? <laughs> some of them are good and some of them are bloody terrible. So um, you want sanguineum, if you want this nice low mounded plant, it loves sun. It'll also do fine in part shade, but sun is where it's happy. It's also drought tolerant. 
gently self seeds. As you can see what it's done here in my garden, I started out with this plant here and it gently self seeds, but it's never a problem. It's not a pest. And um, I've never even been tempted to give mine away because it is so pretty. I'll give you a hint about this plant after it finishes flowering. If you take your hedge shears, either the manual ones that go like this or a battery powered head shear that goes off the top. If you shear these plants in half, they will come back with new foliage and more flowers later in the summer. If you don't wanna do that, that's fine. It looks decent enough. So um, peonies of course are wonderful. And let me say this about peonies. Um, these peonies are in my garden and they are never staked, okay? I have probably maybe two dozen peonies uh, in my property and there is only one that I stake for whatever reason that particular plant grows taller stems and they're heavier and so they fall down. But the rest of my peonies do not. And I think that the reason is they are kept on a lean diet. I never fertilize them and I don't water them every other day. If you've got an automatic irrigation system that's watering your garden frequently, your peonies are gonna stretch and they're gonna fall over. Also, if your peonies are not growing in full sun, they're gonna stretch looking for the light and they're going to fall over. So if you want a peony to be less work, plant it where it's going to get six hours of dead on sun or more, including that noon hour, and don't fertilize it and don't water it frequently. Okay, false indigo, baptisia. Baptisia is also an early summer blooming plant that is very low maintenance. It does not spread, okay? Um, it stays in a nice clump. It does get large. So plant it in a place where it can get three feet tall or four feet tall and four feet in diameter. All right, um, so give it room. And as long as you give it room, it is really a lovely plant. You can either cut off the pods once it's finished flowering or not, that's up to you. I cut mine off because I like how the foliage looks without them. And the foliage is uh, an advantage of this plant. The foliage on this plant looks, uh, gets kind of a blue gray in the fall. And so the plant looks just as stunning in the fall when it's not in flower as when it's in flower in June. It's also a very drought tolerant plant. So this is a plant to put in your hell strip out by the road where nobody waters it except for maybe once a month. <laughs> I love Nepeta. And this is Nepeta Walker's Low, one of my favorites. It's here with allium. Those are allium bulbs in the back. The ones that look green are, were actually white. They bloom earlier. And then they have the green seed pods on them while the purple ones bloom. Um, so that makes a nice combination. And the other good thing about this combination, frankly, is that if you've, whoops, if you've grown allium in the past, you know that the foliage down below starts to die just as the plant is putting up its flower. And a lot of people think that there's something wrong with it, but that's just what this plant does. That's its characteristic. And so what you need to do as a gardener is plant allium in and among other perennials so that when that allium is in flower and the foliage looks terrible, the foliage is being hidden by nepeta, by daylilies, by the other, uh, you know, um, uh, perennials that are in the garden. This, by the way, is how Nepeta Walker's Low looks later in July. And I wanted to show you this because there are several ways to handle Nepeta. One is to do nothing and it just kind of looks faded and it has sporadic little flowers and it looks decent enough the rest of the year. So you can just leave it alone and not touch it, fine. Um, the other option with a cat mint is you can cut it right to the ground. That's what I do. 
And the reason I do that is it comes back within a week and a half with new fresh foliage that looks better. And I have space around it that I can put in annuals because I am a huge believer in adding annuals into the perennial garden. Um, so, but if you don't wanna add annuals into your garden, you could leave it like that. The other option for this is again, to take those hedge trimmers and chop, 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 uh, shear it in half. That also uh, gets rid of the old flowers and it kind of neatens it up, looks kind of like a nice round shrub for the rest of the summer that way. So um, let's talk about some perennials for sun for mid to late summer. And Russian sage is one of my favorites. It is one of the longest flowering perennials. So if you're looking for a perennial that blooms for a long time um, uh, and blooms from sort of the mid July, end of July through August into September, oftentimes even into October, Russian sage is for you. Here's a hint about Russian sage. Remember I told you that peonies um, would prefer not, to, it's better not to fertilize them so that they don't fall. Russian sage does better if you give it a little more fertilizer, uh, particularly an, an application spring and maybe in the midsummer as well. Russian sage, I think, also looks better planted in big groups. Don't put one of these in your perennial garden and don't space out one here and one here and one there. Put a group of five of them together and then you've got something that's worth looking at. <laughs> And here is a group of probably, I don't know, eight, 10 Russian sage at the coastal Maine Botanic Garden with hot papaya echinacea. Now, I, I am identifying this echinacea because I know that the picture is nice. And you have the red of the echinacea, that kind of coral red, and that echoes the uh, rose hips on the Rosa rugosa in the back. And then you've got the blue Russian sage, and it's a great combo but I am not necessarily recommending hot papaya echinacea. It's fairly short-lived. So if you don't mind a perennial that's gonna only live about three years, then by all means buy it and plant it. But a lot of the kind of fancier echinaceas um, don't last that long in the garden. So um, be, be, be warned. <laughs> Agastache Blue Fortune is another long blooming perennial that gets about four feet tall. And it's another one that looks best planted in a group. Right here in this picture, you see at least three of them. And I, again, these are plants that you wanna plant fairly close together, maybe 18 inches apart, center to center. And you wanna plant a group of them um, because Oftentimes tall plants, if there's just one, unless there are lots of them, kind of looks odd. So Agastache, Blue Fortune. Blue Fortune is different than some of the others. It's longer lived, that's a good thing. It blooms a long time, that's a good thing. Hummingbirds like it, also good. Uh, butterflies like it, also good. Makes a good cut flower. Uh, you know, everything to recommend it. Uh, really pretty, and here is a group of it planted with some other summer flowering perennials like uh, Echinacea, and um, this is Geranium Roseanne. Um, and again, you see it's a big group of it. And that's what has that pow that makes the garden really come alive. A great bloomer for the end of the summer are the hardy hibiscus. These do so well on Cape Cod. And they come short, medium, and tall. This is Blue River 2, one of my favorites. It looks like crisp, starched linen in the garden. Um, a new one opens every day over about a three or four week period. The one thing that you have to watch out for with all of the hardy hibiscus, you can see it here. See those holes on the leaves there on the left? That is the damage done by hibiscus sawfly larva. And you want to spray that hibiscus with a um, uh, spinosad, one application around the 4th of July. I, I just have it kind of, now it's on my mental calendar, but it used to be actually written on my calendar. Uh, the 4th of July, spray the hardy hibiscus. 
And if you spray them then with spinosad, they're not in bloom yet. Spray the under of the leaf, underside of the leaves. You only have to do it once and it's taken care of and you don't have that sawfly larva problem. So put that on your list. This is a uh, raspberry rose hardy hibiscus. And I, you know, gave you a little caution here. This one gets seven feet tall. Um, so if you want a really tall, gorgeous hardy hibiscus with slightly smaller flowers, raspberry rose is a good one. And as I say, there is everything in between. You can find hardy hibiscus that only get three feet tall and you can find them four feet and five feet and six feet. Um, so there is one for every garden. You can find them even with purple leaves. Uh, so they, you have that contrast going on and white and pink and red flowers. Um, I don't think that they've bred a yellow one yet, but in any case, uh, these do very well on the Cape and perfect for end of the summer flowering. And you can see they're in flower at the same time as the Russian sage. And this plant uh, is Cleome here. Um, that's not a perennial, so. So let's talk about flowers, perennials for fall in the sun, okay? And sedum autumn joy or pure joy or autumn charm are wonderful if you plant them in the right place and don't fertilize them, don't overwater them. They want as much sun as possible, okay? And the reason you don't want to overwater them or fertilize them is because then they get so tall and heavy that they'll fall over. You want your sedum to look like this. And pure joy stays pretty short and Autumn charm stays pretty short. Autumn joy gets a little taller. It's fine as long as a, once again, you keep it on a lean diet. Um, and it's, a, it's an acid in the garden. And this truly is a low maintenance perennial. As long as you don't, you know, if, if you keep it on that lean diet, you don't have to touch this plant from the minute it comes up at the end of March until it's got snow on the dried heads in December. So a, a good low maintenance plant. Here is another plant that people ask me about in July when they visit my garden during the hydrangea festival because of the foliage. Again, it's got that very grassy foliage. And this is Vernonia lettermanii, iron butterfly. And iron butterfly in the fall, in October, bursts into bloom with these purple flowers it loves the sun, it's pretty um, heat and drought tolerant, and it stays just a nice round mound and you don't have to touch it um, before or after it blooms until you're ready to cut it down uh, the following spring when you do a spring cleanup. Uh, it is a native plant and so a good one to have for supporting native uh, butterflies and, and other wildlife. I love the Sheffield pink dendranthema. These used to be called chrysanthemums and then the botanists renamed them dendranthema. And so this one is Sheffield pink, which happens to be my favorite. It's a very soft peachy pink and it flowers toward the end of September, early October and um, really pretty. I don't touch this plant either from you know, the minute that it comes up in the spring until I'm ready to cut it down after the winter um, coming into the spring. Now, what many of you have been waiting for, let's talk shade. And let's talk honestly about shade, okay? Um, you have probably noticed that there are many more plants for shade that flower in the spring. And it's not your imagination. <laughs> Think about it. Okay, in the spring, when the leaves haven't come out on the trees yet, right? Those plants in a shade garden are getting more sun. And so that's why there are more both wildflowers and perennials that bloom in the spring in the shade. It's all the, you know, just the natural way that plants grow. So 
Let's talk about ones that bloom in the spring, a few that um, you may not have. The Lenten Rose, number one on my list, because this one starts flowering in March um, and it flowers March and April and into May. The calyxes um, on this plant look like petals. And so they last uh, for so long and it's a, just a really pretty, pretty plant. They do, many of them have their flowers kind of um, nodding over. So if you have a slope um, or terrace, this is a good one to put up so that you can see some of them from the bottom up as well as some of them from the top down. It's an evergreen plant. All, the only maintenance that you need to do for this plant is to um, come, you know, once winter is finally over, you can cut off any of the leaves that might look particularly, you know, winter worn or black um, or be left from last year. Other than that, it doesn't need much care. This is a plant that kind of prefers soil that is more toward the alkaline side. So if your uh, Lenten rose has not performed well, have a soil test done and see if your soil is too acidic. And no, the pine trees in the area are not acidifying the soil. That's an old myth. Uh, but we have naturally acidic soil here on the Cape. So um, if, you know, if the Lenten rose isn't blooming well, my guess is that it might not be alkaline enough. I think everybody needs Virginia bluebells, Vertensia, Virginica. Um, these are so beautiful and they are blue, blue, blue with pink buds. Who doesn't love that combination? Uh, the thing to know about these plants is that as soon as they are done blooming, they go to seed and they disappear from the garden. So if you wanna find them in the garden center, you have to look for them early because since they go dormant immediately after blooming, right after blooming and they're basically an empty pot. <laughs> and so, um, we tend not to get them in later in the summer. So if you want them, look for them early. Uh, but they gently self-seed around the garden. And it's kind of nice that they go dormant in a perennial garden because then that opens up some space where you can plant some begonias for all summer color in your shady garden. And that is the number one thing. If you're tired of the regular impatience, um, go for begonias because they have bred 4 million types of begonias and new one comes out every 10 minutes and you can find one in whatever color you love and plant them after your Virginia bluebells go dormant. Epimedium is a plant that I would not be without. This I think is the best plant to plant around hydrangeas. Um, because it's weed smothering, the rabbits don't eat it, the deer don't eat it, it has sweet flowers in the spring, it um, combines well, it's a good match with a narcissus in part shade uh, gardens, and in the spring those heart-shaped leaves often have little red around them, it's so sweet. They come with pink flowers and yellow flowers, um, it's also called barren wart, um, wart being an old name for plant. And you'll see many names with wart or wort at the end of them. That's an old Middle English term for plant. So I don't know why it was called barren plant, but there you go. Uh, it is a plant that marries beautifully with hosta because it's got delicate foliage and it's lower. So if you've got hosta, you should plant epimedium in between the hostas uh, because that combined so beautifully. And it flowers when the host is still thinking about breaking dormancy. We love old fashioned bleeding heart. Once again, a, a plant that uh, is wonderful early in the spring. This particular variety does well in shade, but it does go dormant after it finishes blooming like the Virginia bluebells that you see um, paired with it here in this garden. So uh, once again, once they go dormant, you've got all that space around them for planting some begonias or other shade loving annuals. I love our native foam flower. 
This one happens to be Spring Symphony. It is a, a spring flowering shade perennial. And not only does it have these lovely flowers for at least a month and a half, oftentimes two months. If you feel ambitious and want to deadhead it, it blooms even longer. I never do, but if you feel ambitious, you, you could deadhead it, it would bloom longer. But they have such gorgeous foliage, right? And, and you can get them with uh, big splotches and little splotches on them. Once again, this is a plant that works well with the big leaf hostas because the foliage contrasts. And once again, it works well with hostas because it is in flower when the hostas are still thinking about coming up. The other great thing about Chiorella is that it's about semi-evergreen. It looks decent enough into the winter. Early summer in the shade garden, the fern leaf bleeding heart. In fact, this bleeding heart in my garden where it gets a little, gets about three hours of sun in the morning, okay? It blooms all summer long, literally. And so it's not an exaggeration on this tag that it's a repeat bloomer. And I don't deadhead it and the hummingbirds love it. And um, it's great for hummingbirds because the very first hummingbirds to arrive um, before anything else is in bloom, this is in bloom and they're right there. So if you wanna welcome those hummingbirds with open arms, plant a fern leaf bleeding heart. There are two varieties. This is the East Coast native variety and this one is the West Coast um, native variety. They're both called fern leaf or fringe leaf bleeding heart, and they come with, you know, light pink, dark pink, white flowers. Um, great plants for the shade garden. Hackone grass. All right, it doesn't flower, but this, you have to have it for the color and the texture. If you've got a shade garden, it does really well if it's getting at least a couple of hours of sun. I would definitely plant it where it's getting at least two hours of sun. But that said, I mean, look at how great it looks with the hosta. And as you shade people know, um, you have to go for foliage, texture, and color big time in a shade garden because there are fewer flowers that bloom well in the shade. But this hack on grass and this one is Oriola. Um, it is just a gorgeous plant in the garden. Here is my Oriola early in the season, okay? It comes up bright yellow in April. I've got the Lunaria in bloom here, which is not a perennial, but it is a, um, whoops, it is a um, uh, biennial. And um, then with the Heucra, you know, you have the, the round leaves of the Heucra and the texture of the core of the hackone grass and it is a fabulous combination and of course we want those coral bells that heucra in a shade garden this is the perennial section at country garden um, early in the season heucras many of them have their best color early in the season okay and so, you know, uh, if, you know, some of these, they'll fade a little bit or they'll turn kind of a more of a caramel color as the season goes on, still gorgeous plants. But early in the season, boy, you get that pop of leaf color. And as you can see, you can find purple and lime green and coral, uh, wonderful, wonderful plants. Plants for shade for midsummer. There are fewer, okay, there are fewer. And I am only showing you a couple of my favorites. There are, you know, more that I'm not showing you for various reasons, but I'm showing you a few that you may might not be familiar with. And Phlox Jenna, uh, this is in my garden and it's in a place where it gets very little direct sun. It gets some dappled sun for, I would say probably, five hours during the day through the various oak trees and the shrubs and everything that are nearby, but it reliably comes into bloom. It is a phlox that does not get mildew. Native plant, hummingbird plant, butterfly plant. It's a better cut flower, in my opinion, than the other big flowered phlox paniculata because these flowers combine nicely in bouquets. So as long as you've got some sunshine in your shade garden, this is a wonderful plant. 
and cardinal flower. I love this in my shade garden. It self seeds, but in a very nice way. This is an exclamation point plant. All right, and I love it for that reason. And you can see here, it's an exclamation point in a shade garden. The hummingbirds also love it. And if you say you don't like red in your garden, I am asking you to snap out of it because in the midsummer, in a shade garden, this is really valuable to have that bright color. So look for this and it's another native plant. And fall in the shade garden, this is my favorite. Okay, Actea brunette, AKA bugbane. There are several varieties. Brunette and Hillside Black Beauty are my favorite because they have that purple foliage that you see here. They come into flower end of August and they're a flower through September. They're stopping your tracks fragrant. And so they are just wonderful, um, particularly near a deck or a patio where you sit out in the late summer and early fall, either with your cocktail in the evening or your morning coffee, you will get that fragrance from this lovely plant. It's sturdy, you don't need to stake it. In fact, I see birds landing on these stems all the time and they don't even bend over when the finches or you know the, the little birds, the chickadees are on them. So this to me is a must have plant for the shade garden. So the other thing I'm gonna tell you about the shade, plant blue hydrangeas, right? Because in terms of flowers in, in part shade that last from the end of June into September, you know, so many of the blue hydrangeas are where it's at. And you can get short like Rio, one of my favorites. You can get medium like Enchantress, another one of my favorites. You can get taller like Endless Summer. So. Um, next week, the handout with all these plant names and when they flower are going to be available at Hyannis Country Garden registers. So let's stop screen share and let me get back to the chat. And let's start off with the questions. Excellent. Ah, Tom, leftover coffee, really? Make yourself a fresh cup, Tom, come on, live a little. Okay. Uh, all right, let's see. Um, where in the Mid Hudson Valley? You know what? I lived for 11 years um, in Spencertown, New York. So that's where I lived, Columbia, Columbia County. And I left that horrible ego podium, Bishop's Weed, there. Whew. Um, why must you plant allium only in the fall? Yes, unless you find it in the garden center. You know, sometimes in the garden center, we'll have pots of it in the spring. The problem is because that foliage, is looking terrible as the, as the flower comes up, it's not a good seller in the garden center in the spring because it looks like something's wrong with it, right? So yes, plant it in the fall. Get yourself some bulbs and plant them in the fall. Um, I'm glad, Colleen, that you also love Russian sage. Um, you know, uh, Susan, I'm not sure what you, what you meant by can you spell that because I don't monitor the chat while I'm talking. I can't talk about these plants and read at the same time. The human brain is incapable of multitasking and I've long since accepted that fact. <laughs> ah, homemade egg and milk rabbit repellent. Um, yes, any liquid rabbit repellent, the ones that you buy in the store if you don't wanna make your own are either egg, milk or blood based, all right? You can make your own with a beaten egg, a cup of milk and a half a gallon of water, strain it through a dishcloth so that um, it doesn't clog up your sprayer and spray it on your plants before Thumper starts to eat. That's the key. You wanna prevent them from developing the habit rather than trying to break the habit. Lynn, if you have moss in your flower bed, uh, that's an indication that it needs amending. You probably haven't uh, mulched uh, in the recent you know, um, years or top dressed with compost or composted manure. If you mulch regularly, you don't get moss because it's amending from the top down. It's bare compact soil that gets moss. Um, moss does not have anything to do with liming. Don't believe that old myth, it's not true. Moss is happy to grow on alkaline soil or acidic soil, um, but you have to address the compact 
and um, low um, organic matter nature of that garden. And so I would, I've got a little moss growing right now um, out in one of my perennial beds. I am going to be raking it off, number one. Number two, because I don't um, mulch that garden because I have annual poppies that self seed there. I will, however, top dress that garden with compost to beef up the organic matter and start amending from the top down so that the moss doesn't grow. You can plant Lenten rose any time it comes into the garden center. So, um, and usually we have them early in the spring and sometimes we have them also uh, throughout the rest of the season. How do you prepare the soil for planting perennials? Uh, great question. The worst thing to do, what you don't want to do is dig a little hole mix in some compost or peat moss or something and plant in that little hole. You do not want to do that, okay? If you want a perennial bed, what you want to do initially is have somebody turn the soil with a rototiller, all right? Then you top dress the entire bed with a couple of inches of compost, compost and manure, not peat moss. Compost, compost and manure, the whole bed and then you turn it in again, and then you start to plant. After that, you never have to turn it again, of course. You don't have to double dig or all those old, that's old school from, I don't know, when they were crazy with the shovel. <laughs> and um, uh, so, but you do wanna loosen the soil initially, and you wanna amend the entire bed initially. After that, the soil gets amended from the top down with an inch of mulch every year or some compost. Um, you never, Naomi never knows when to cut down when. You know, there are several methods and there's no one right way here, which is good, right? Um, there are people like myself that tend to leave uh, many of the perennials in the garden. It gives places for um, seeds for wildlife, places for things like uh, butterfly, you know, cocoons and, and you know, various um, insects, beneficial insects over winter in all of those grasses and, and reeds and, you know, sticks and everything. So one method is to leave that all winter and cut it all back sometime at the end of March, all right? Another method is if, you, if it's not an asset in the garden and you don't like how it looks, cut it off, all right? That's another method. Um, and basically, if it's green, it must be seen. So anything in the fall that's still green, it's photosynthesizing, that's doing a job for that plant. So leave that and then if you need to, you know, clean it up in the spring, by all means, you can do that. I did not mention hostas. Everybody knows about hostas, all right? That's, you know, I, I didn't mention a lot of very common plants. So we only have an hour here and there are 4 million wonderful hostas. So I, I know you know about hostas and I think everybody else does too. <laughs> um, geraniums repel bunnies. Uh, it's not that they repel them, but the bunnies don't eat them. The bunnies don't eat geranium macrorhizum and they don't eat geranium sanguineum. And both of those are very good plants for the garden. Um, no, Charlotte, we don't email the handout for this talk, I'm sorry. It's a benefit of coming into the store, right? Uh, Country Garden is making it possible for me to be here with you for these happy hours. And we wanna show them a little love by going into the store. Uh, what perennials grow in wet areas? Uh, first of all, that cardinal flower that I showed you, Lobelia cardinal, card, cardinalis, um, that loves wet soil. Secondly, uh, the perennial green and gold. If you, if you type in green and gold perennial in Google, you'll come up with it. It's Chrysogonum. Um, but that one also loves wet soil. Let's think of a third. Um, oh, all the primroses. Japanese primrose loves wet soil. And a eupatorium, the Joe Pye weed, all of the various eupatoriums, and there are short, medium, and tall native eupatoriums, they love wet soil. Okay, thank you for coming, Barbara. Any remedy for deer eating hosta? Yes. Number one, spray them as soon as they are this big with a 
blood, milk, or egg-based repellent. Number two, get yourself some wireless deer fence. You have to order it online. Uh, it is a wonderful product. You get it from wirelessdeerfence.com. And I, um, I have deer on this property. I have two and a half acres. The deer stroll by regularly right through my property and I protect it with six of these wireless deer fence. So um, you can read online about uh, how they work, okay? Uh, let's see, will the rabbit repellent repel opossums as well? No, not that I'm aware of. Um, the reason that rabbit and deer repellent works is they are um, herbivores, they don't eat animal products, and so they um, won't eat something with egg, milk, or blood on it. Uh, opossums are omnivores, they eat a little of everything, they eat grubs, they eat fruit, they, you know, so um, if they're a problem, you can, you know, sort of erect a barrier. If they're a problem for you in the summertime, um, check out Spray Away or um, Scarecrow, that motion activated sprinkler systems. Uh, we usually have Scarecrow in the store and those work very well for animals like raccoons and opossums that the repellents don't work on. Does Russian sage transplant well? Well enough, try to get as big of a, a ba ball of dirt as you can. Might die, if you do it this spring, it might die back a little more um, this year, but it should come up well from the ground. Uh, thank you, Tamara. Uh, let's see, what shall I do about beautiful climbing rose, which is reaching the roof, started cut, cutting from Michigan. Well, you're gonna have to cut it back, Liz. You're gonna have to bite the bullet and you're gonna to have to go out there this spring in April, and you're gonna to have to identify the biggest, oldest canes and cut a couple of them this tall. And then you go and you look at the next biggest, oldest canes and you cut a couple of them three feet tall. And then you look at the next biggest and you cut those five feet tall. And that's how you prune a climbing rose, whether it's on the roof or not. Um, and any plants repel mosquitoes and gnats? Unfortunately not. Um, you know, you'll read all kinds of crazy myths online about lemongrass and scented geraniums. They don't really repel um, mosquitoes. The mosquito repellents that you can buy, uh, you know, do work for a few days. And I have used them times when we're going to have a wedding here uh, on my property or an event of some sort. I have used that granular mosquito, I think it's called mosquito beater, and it works quite well, but nothing of course works forever. And in terms of mosquitoes where you are gathering, citronella candles work as well as anything else. Uh, let's see, can the wireless deer fence keep bunnies away too? No, unfortunately not. Yeah, I told the veterinarian that invented wireless deer fence, I said, if you could invent wireless woodchuck fence or wireless rabbit fence, you'd make a fortune. Um, but they work for the deer because deer have a flight response and the other animals don't. So unfortunately not. Uh, let's see, what do I do about voles after, you know, you ignore them, Paul, Paul, you know, right now, in fact, I today went out with my camera and took a picture of the vole trails that are in my yard because I get questions about them all the time. So I wanted to be able to show people what they look like. Ignore them. Um, we always have voles. Don't make an enemy of, you know, the wildlife. Do they eat occasionally the roots of your plants? Yeah, occasionally. But if you have a lot of plants, they're not going to eat everything. Number one, you encourage predators like skunks. Did you know that 50% of a skunk's diet are baby rodents like voles? You encourage the predators, you know, in the neighborhood, you make peace with every uh, one, you plant for diversity and you'll be fine. Ignore those trails. Uh, let's see, can I grow cardina flowers from seed? Yes, they are easy to grow from seed. So get yourself some seeds for that. Uh, they will be, by the way, smaller um, this year. You know, you're not gonna have instant cardinal flower this year, but you will have good enough this year. They may or may not bloom, but after that, you will always have them. Is there a good fertilizer formula that can be applied to entire flower beds? Catherine, first of all, have a soil test done. 
make sure that you need to fertilize. That's number one, okay? I cannot stress that more. Uh, particularly if you happen to live on Cape Cod where we are surrounded by waterways, we wanna keep those waterways healthy, don't we? And so um, you only fertilize if a soil test shows that you need to do that. That said, either plant tone if you have sandy soil or flower tone if you have regular soil are good general fertilizers that you can use over an entire flower bed, no matter what you're growing. All right, and I've got time for two, the last two questions. Okay, will rabbit repellent work on chipmunks? No, but you know what I've used to harass chipmunks? And once again, you know, there's a point where we make peace with them. I, I know sometimes I'm worried my whole house is gonna cave down because the chipmunks are, you know, building their tunnels everywhere. And I have on occasion, maybe twice, in the 13 years that I've lived here, stepped into one part of my garden and my foot has gone down a foot, right? Uh, because the chipmunks had tunneled in there. So I know the problem that chipmunks can be, but like foals, their populations come and go. We need to encourage the predators. We need to not put out rat poison or any poisons that are going to hurt our hawks or our owls that eat these animals. We want to not make an enemy of the skunks because they eat these animals. And so we encourage um, the, the balance of wildlife and we accept the fact, because we have to accept the fact that populations come and go. And um, some years there are more chipmunks than others. Okay, that said, if you've got chipmunk holes and you wanna try and get them to move elsewhere, we sell a product at Country Garden called Rat Magic, R-A-T, Rat Magic. And it is labeled for repelling rats, of course, and mice and chipmunks. And basically it is made out of um, oils of plants, rosemary and cinnamon and clove oils, right? in a granular form. I have poured that down holes where the, ch the chipmunks have made holes where I really don't want them to be. Does it kill them? No, but I don't want to kill them. I want them to go elsewhere. And that has worked for me. So rat magic. And I guess that's it. Oh, is Russian sage dangerous to cats? Patty, I have no idea. Um, Here's the thing though, you know, most animals do know when something is dangerous, but I would say if you have an animal that is prone to eating a plant, whether it's a dog or a cat, or if you have a child who you see is prone to eating a plant, first of all, stop them, number one. Second of all, then look that plant up, call your veterinarian, call poison control and find out, all right? So, uh, and yes, coyotes are good for our gardens too. Thank you. Coyotes, welcome them. All right. Don't let your pets out unattended, but welcome those coyotes. They also keep things in balance. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am so glad that you were with me and I look forward to being with you in the next happy hour or the next Sunday seminar. You can read all about those and sign up for them on the events page at hyannascountrygarden.com. Have a wonderful weekend.